You can support In the Past Lane with as little as $1 a month. Just go to the support page at our website, inthepastlane.com. Thanks. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect huddled union, masses yearning to breathe consider free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. And the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Hi there. Welcome to In the Past Lane, a podcast about American history and why it matters. Brought to you by SBI, Snoring Beagle International. I'm your host, historian at large, Edward T. O'Donnell, and here's what happened this week in American history. On February 9th, 1825, 195 years ago this week, John Quincy Adams was elected president of the United States. But this was an unusual and highly controversial election, to say the least. It wasn't decided by votes cast by the American people, but rather by members of the House of Representatives. In fact, John Quincy Adams had finished second in the popular vote to a man named Andrew Jackson. In a four-candidate contest, Jackson received 151,000 votes and 99 electoral votes. John Quincy Adams racked up 113,000 votes and 84 electoral votes. But because the third and fourth place finishers earned 78 electoral votes between them, Jackson's 99 fell well short of the 131 needed to win the presidency. And so, in accordance with the 12th Amendment to the Constitution, an election in which no candidate wins a majority of electoral college votes is decided by the members of the House of Representatives who choose between the top three finishers. And this is where things got really interesting. Over the course of two months, from the election in November 1824 to early February 1825, all manner of backroom negotiations and deal-making took place, as Jackson, Adams, and the third-place finisher, William H. Crawford of Georgia, vied for votes among the representatives. In the end, the outcome was determined when the fourth-place finisher, Henry Clay of Kentucky, threw his support to Adams. The votes in the House were tallied by state delegations, so Adams ended up winning 13 states to Jackson's 7 and Crawford's 4. A few weeks later, on March 4, 1825, John Quincy Adams was sworn in as the sixth president of the United States. He was, by all accounts, one of the most accomplished and qualified men ever elected president. He was the son of a founding father and second president of the United States, John Adams. He was highly educated and had spent decades in public office, serving a term as senator from Massachusetts as well as minister to the United Kingdom. Russia, Prussia, and the Netherlands. He also served as Secretary of State under President James Monroe. But all this talent and experience was no match for the bruising politics of the day. From the moment the House announced that Adams had won the election of 1824, Andrew Jackson cried foul. He claimed that Adams had struck what he called a, quote, corrupt bargain with Henry Clay to steal the election from him. As proof, Jackson pointed to the fact that Adams had named Henry Clay as his Secretary of State, presumably as a reward for his support in the election. And so, with this scandal hanging over him, John Quincy Adams spent four unpleasant and largely ineffectual years in the White House. In 1824, he lost his bid for re-election in a landslide to his rival, Andrew Jackson. But then John Quincy Adams did something extraordinary. He ran for and won a seat in the House of Representatives and served there from 1831 until his death in 1848. Known as Old Man Eloquent by his colleagues, he promoted education, manufacturing, and large infrastructure projects like canals and highways. But Representative Adams is mostly remembered for his vehement opposition to slavery. As he once said, If the fundamental principles of the Declaration of Independence, as self-evident truths, are real truths, the existence of slavery in any form is a wrong. In 1840, his credentials as a skilled lawyer and a passionate abolitionist led to his selection as defense counsel for 33 Africans who had led a mutiny aboard the slave ship Amistad. Adams argued the case before the United States Supreme Court and won their freedom. Most historians agree that John Quincy Adams' post-presidential career was the most consequential in American history, rivaled only by that of another one-term president, Jimmy Carter. Let's turn to birthdays. February 4, 1913, civil rights leader Rosa Parks was born in Tuskegee, Alabama. Rosa Parks became famous in 1955 when she was arrested for defying Jim Crow laws by refusing to give up her seat on a city bus to a white man. Her arrest galvanized the city's African-American community, led in part by an unknown 26-year-old preacher named Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. They launched a boycott that lasted over a year until a U.S. Supreme Court decision declared segregated buses unconstitutional. The most important thing to know about Rosa Parks is that she didn't make history by accident. 
She had been a civil rights activist for many years before 1955, and she wanted to get arrested that day. And Rosa Parks spent the rest of her life fighting for social justice. She once said, I would like to be remembered as a person who wanted to be free so other people would be free. February 6, 1756, Aaron Burr was born in Newark, New Jersey. Following service in the Continental Army during the American Revolution, Burr became a very successful attorney, often working side by side in many cases with another accomplished lawyer named Alexander Hamilton. But the two eventually became bitter political rivals, leading to their famous duel on July 11, 1804, in which Burr killed Hamilton. And here's a strange fact. Burr, who was vice president of the United States at the time, remained in office for eight months after the duel. That must have been a bit uncomfortable. And then, just for good measure, two years later, in 1807, Burr got involved in a sketchy scheme that led to him being tried for treason. And you can learn all about that incident in In the Past Lane, episode 89. February 8th, 1820, William Tecumseh Sherman was born in Lancaster, Ohio. Sherman emerged, like Ulysses S. Grant, as one of the Union's most effective generals in the latter half of the Civil War. What set Sherman and Grant apart from their predecessors, like Generals George B. McClellan and Ambrose Burnside, was their understanding that modern warfare required the relentless pursuit of the enemy. As Sherman famously put it, war is cruelty. There is no use trying to reform it. The crueler it is, the sooner it will be over. February 9, 1737, political writer and activist Thomas Paine was born in Thetford, England. Paine came to America in 1774, just in time for the American Revolution. His 1776 pamphlet, Common Sense, was enormously influential in promoting the idea of American independence from Great Britain. He followed it with another widely read series of pamphlets titled The Crisis, that urged Americans to remain united and steadfast in the dark days of the war for independence. But because Paine was far more radical in his politics than most of the founders, and in his scorching criticism of organized religion, he never gained an equal place in the history books alongside people like Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and Alexander Hamilton. Other notable birthdays this week include February 3rd, 1894, Norman Rockwell, February 4th, 1921, Betty Friedan, February 5th, 1934, Hank Aaron, and February 6th, 1911, President Ronald Reagan. Let's turn to events. February is Black History Month, so what's the story behind it? Well, back in 1915, an African-American historian named Carter G. Woodson founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. The goal was to research and promote the accomplishments of African-Americans and their contributions to the United States. Woodson wanted this history to inspire African-Americans in their struggle for equal rights and opportunity in Jim Crow America. As he put it, if a race has no history, if it has no worthwhile tradition, it becomes a negligible factor in the thought of the world, and it stands in danger of being exterminated. In 1926, Woodson's organization established Negro History Week in mid-February to coincide with the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. In the 1960s, in response to the Civil Rights Movement, it was transformed into Black History Month. February 5, 1917, women's rights activist and birth control advocate Margaret Sanger was jailed in New York City. The charge? Operating a women's health clinic that distributed birth control and information on family planning. But it didn't stop Sanger. She remained defiant and determined, and a few years later she founded Planned Parenthood. Margaret Sanger was also the key figure behind the efforts to develop the birth control pill, which was approved by the FDA in 1960. February 5, 1937, straight from the Department of It Seemed Like a Good Idea at the Time, President Franklin Roosevelt announced his plan to expand the number of seats on the Supreme Court from 9 to 15. FDR, who had just won re-election by a wide margin, believed the American public would support his plan, which was designed to overcome a conservative majority on the court by adding liberal judges who would preserve his New Deal programs. Instead, the public saw what came to be called the court-packing scheme as a power grab. The negative reaction was so intense, FDR soon withdrew the proposal. Other notable events this week, February 3, 1913, the 16th Amendment was ratified, allowing Congress to impose an income tax. February 4, 1826, James Fenimore Cooper published The Last of the Mohicans. February 4, 1945, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt met with Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin at Yalta to plan the final phase of World War II. February 7, 1964, the British rock and roll band The Beatles arrived in New York City to begin their first U.S. tour. Let's just say the reaction was intense. Okay, time for the last word. Let's give it to Tom Paine, who was born 283 years ago this week. Here's the most memorable passage from his pamphlet, The Crisis, in which he exhorted the patriots to avoid despair and keep supporting the fight for independence, even though the outlook seemed bleak. 
These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us. The harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods. And it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. Well, that's going to do it for In the Past Lane this week. You can learn more about me and everything we talked about at InThePassLane.com. And let's interact via social media. I'm at In the Past Lane on both Twitter and Instagram, and our Facebook page is In the Past Lane Podcast. See you next week. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. Mm-hmm.